to The Fitterist Show with your host, Christopher Allen, where we explore the art of mind and body conditioning. In the ever-changing landscape of fitness technology, this week we discuss three new stories regarding mergers and acquisitions. First up, we have device maker Garmin acquiring its former downstream data analytics partner, First Beat Analytics, and their go-forward plans. Next, the debut of a new Peloton subscription on Roku devices provides numerous instructor-led workouts with or without equipment directly in the comfort of one's living room. And finally, with a plethora of connected fitness devices, smartwatches, and fitness phone apps, where does all of that personalized fitness data go? We take a look at some of the factors behind Google's planned acquisition of Fitbit, announced in November of 2019, as regulators start to review the details around data and privacy concerns raised by consumer groups. So, let's dive in. First up, we have Garmin acquiring First Beat Analytics, the company behind its smartwatch fitness and health tracking features. First Beat Analytics provides software that helps monitor stress, sleep, respiration rate, and more for Garmin and other consumer smartwatch manufacturers. Garmin announced at the very end of June, on June 30th, that it had purchased First Beat Technologies, the First Beat Analytics, its business unit responsible for physiological measurement algorithms for use with consumer health and wellness devices. The exact terms of the deal were not disclosed. First Beat Analytics is headquartered in Finland and has been providing software that interprets various data collected from sensors. It's licensed that technology to a handful of consumer fitness device makers, including Garmin, who's been a customer for some years, to enable tracking of where stress, sleep, VO2 max, respiration rate, calories burned, and a host of other different metrics. So as I mentioned, First Beat Analytics has been a customer of Garmin's for a long period, about almost a decade. So they're very familiar with the the company, the team, the physiologists, the scientists, and the engineers that are part of the First Beat Analytics. And First Beat will continue to operate out of its current facilities, again, in Finland. And it might be important to draw a little distinction between First Beat Analytics, which is the consumer licensing business of First Beat Technologies. So First Beat Technologies has another business that is not part of the Garmin acquisition that is focused on corporate and sports customers. So this is the consumer-facing licensing technology and analytics division that they had acquired. So in terms of the deal rationale, Garmin basically looked at the landscape and saw this partner that was really an expert at transforming heartbeat data from consumer devices into meaningful information and advice to enhance performance and well-being. And they've been doing this for about 20 years. And First Speed Analytics uses a combination of sensor data, including heart rate variability. They also blend in physiological science with mathematics to provide advanced analytics, advanced metrics in the areas of stress, sleep, VO2 max, training status, training load, training effect, respiration rate, calories burned, and many more different aspects. So Garmin looked at this and said, we're probably stronger having this under our own umbrella so we can pair the software with our hardware. And that data allows users to make better, more informed decisions about training and recovery. Another driver of the acquisition is in the area of healthcare, which has been touted regularly as the next big growth frontier for technology stocks. Most of the tech companies are trying to strengthen their healthcare footprint on the back of a combination of technologies from artificial intelligence, machine learning, AR, VR, and of course, data analytic initiatives. So the latest acquisition really focused on personal health monitoring will help Garmin expand its market share in the fitness space and beyond just pure reporting of exercise metrics. So Garmin customers will now be able to provide their smartwatch users with more valuable data, in turn helping those their end customers make better and more informed decisions around training and recovery. Also part of the deal, 
will be that licensing division that falls under Garmin now that will license that same data analytics technology to competitors. Competitors like Casio, Xiaomi, Huawei, Amazfit, Sunto. There's a number of companies that have been licensing that first beat analytics technology. So that now falls under the Garmin umbrella. So moving forward, strategic acquisitions for Garmin have allowed them to now expand its product portfolio and into a new area, including the licensing technology of First Beat Analytics. The company has added technologies that are gradually expanding and enabling it to enter these new categories. And Garmin didn't make this choice lightly. They've been a partner of First Beat for many, many years. So they are very familiar with the technology, the integration into the hardware platforms that they have, and the talent that First Beat Analytics brings to the table. So for them, it looked like a good match. And it looks like, from a vertical integration standpoint, it's a good acquisition. We'll see what Garmin comes out with down the road, but this acquisition should help continue it gaining momentum in its current markets with its customer base and should, in turn, drive some top line growth to the business. Our second news story, Peloton and Roku announced the availability of the Peloton app on the Roku platform beginning July 1st of 2020. So Roku users in the US, you can just add the Peloton channel via the Roku channel store and you get studio style workouts directly in your living room. And again, you don't need to have a Peloton bike or a Peloton treadmill to take advantage of the channel. The Peloton channel provides thousands of instructor led immersive workouts that can be done with or without equipment directly through Roku devices. So if you're already a Peloton subscriber, you can directly log in and take advantage of that. If you're not, you can sign up via Roku Pay to sign up for the Peloton channel directly on the Roku device. The subscription includes the same live and archive classes that the owners of the Peloton bike and treadmill get. However, some of the core features are naturally missing. So if you are a Peloton subscriber and paying $30 a month, you will see all of the performance metrics of a fully paid up member. But if you are not and you just have the light version, you won't see all of the performance metrics. So why is this important? Well, Peloton had at the end of its March quarter had about 886,000 bike and treadmill owners paying $39 a month for its connected fitness subscription. And that's up 94% year over year. So again, their target audience right now is largely affluent households. The bike itself is over $2,000 and they are a loyal group of people. They have a 93% annual retention rate. Due in no small part to the pandemic, business for stationary bikes has been booming. Group cycling classes in crowded indoor spaces basically canceled, and Peloton has filled the gap nicely. They debuted on the stock market at about $25.26. They're currently trading at about $60 a share, so they've done quite nicely since their market debut. In addition to their core subscription platform, Peloton has also released this standalone digital membership. This plan offers access to the growing catalog of live and on-demand workouts. So they figured, look, we've got all these workouts. Don't limit them to people that just have a $2,000 bike. Let's get them out there and get them available to a much broader market opportunity, but at a lower cost. So they lowered the price of these digital app memberships started out 20 bucks they finally settled on 12.99 a month and despite having fairly recently released it peloton ended up with just shy of 177,000 subscribers for this cheaper the 12.99 tier of its digital membership at the end of march and that's about a 64 percent increase over the past year so again why is this important for peloton well these entree level memberships, if you will, help give folks that aren't ready to spring for a $2,500 or $2,000 Peloton bike or treadmill a little taste of the platform, the environment, making them obviously create upsell candidates for future connected fitness subscribers with their hardware. 
and Peloton has already disclosed that they are working on a less expensive stationary bike. And so they're trying to just bifurcate their market penetration strategies with an entree level $12.99 subscription, a mid-tier price point, and their top tier price point, their flagship, which is the cost of the hardware plus 40 bucks a month. So what's in it for Roku? Well, Roku has a fair amount to gain here too. Now, they're primarily viewed as a streaming video platform, but it has hundreds of thousands of apps in its ecosystem. And one of the interesting elements of their press release with Peloton was that the fitness genre is the fastest growing US segment for apps on the Roku platform with 130% year over year growth for the month of May. Now, some of that is clearly pandemic driven, but the platform has about 40 million active accounts on Roku. That's a lot of targeted opportunities for people that already have an internet connected device in their home, in their living room, ready to stream exercise classes right in the home. Not surprisingly, as Roku generates traffic and awareness for the Peloton channel or other health and fitness channels for that matter, it certainly collects a bounty or an ongoing royalty when people sign up for premium subscription apps directly through Roku instead of signing up with, in this case, Peloton. So it should be a win-win for both Peloton and Roku. Roku getting a premier brand to market and they get to collect again a bounty on each of the subscriptions to the Peloton app that they sign up directly through the Roku Pay platform. In addition, Remember, Roku is still an advertising-based platform for the most part. So one shouldn't be surprised if Roku leverages its machine learning and targeting capabilities to advertise the Peloton app or other health and fitness apps directly to Roku users who would probably be most likely to use it and ultimately sign up and subscribe. So as I mentioned, this should be a good win-win for both brands. Both of them have well-recognized brands. During this pandemic, which is transforming the way people exercise at home, in the new normal, streaming TV, working out at home. And if you do some of the math, just as an example, if Roku gets just one half a percent of its active user base on the Roku platform, it will essentially double the digital membership base for Peloton. So there's a win-win and a lot of incentives to go around for both Peloton and Roku. With regard to pricing and availability, of course, it's free if you're an existing Peloton subscriber. New users can sign up directly in the app and pay via Roku Pay. There is a 30-day free trial that's available to new Peloton users at launch. And following that 30-day trial, the Peloton digital membership will be $12.99 per month. And Existing Peloton app subscribers can just sign in directly on the Roku device using their Peloton account credentials. The app is already available on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV, and now, of course, Roku, which pretty much completes the set of living room connected devices. So we'll see how these two big brands, both Roku and Peloton, who have surged through this quarantine and pandemic era welfare going forward. Again, it seems like a good combination, a good win-win. We'll see how they do going forward. And our final news story of the week. Well over 100 million fitness trackers, smartwatches were sold the past year, each of them uploading personal fitness data to the cloud. This amounts to a massive amount of data about millions of people all around the world. Companies are already using the feedback from metrics to work out what motivates people best and how to present the data to increase engagement on those devices. So what happens to all that data? Literally terabytes of personal health data are amassed daily in stunning quantities. As these fitness trackers become more sophisticated and powerful, they're able to collect a wider range of data. The first fitness wearables were pretty much pedometers that had Bluetooth capability. But now, sophistication has grown. They can measure things like heart rate, perspiration, 
VO2 levels, oxygen in the blood, body weight, BMI. And because these are all wearables, they don't only collect this data just when you're exercising. They do it all the time. When you start thinking about continuous data collection, it probably quickly becomes the single biggest source of continuous daily individual data that's ever been created. And it grows exponentially every day. Now, of course, there are refinements that need to be made before this data becomes really useful. Some of the measurement accuracy of the fitness trackers must improve. In the drive to include all the metrics, some of the metrics are more reliable than others. Sleep activity being a notorious one, sometimes it's based on wrist movement, which is not necessarily a great indicator of actual sleep state, just as an example. And as this data starts to become aggregated, it starts to raise some questions around data ownership, which is a major consideration. So as an example, let's take a look at Fitbit, which says in its privacy statement, it may share non-personal information that is aggregated or de-identified so that it cannot reasonably be used to identify an individual. They may disclose such information publicly and to third parties, for example, in public reports about exercise and activity, to partners under agreement with us, or as a part of the community benchmarking information we provide to users of our subscription services. We never sell personal data. We do not share customer personal information, except in the limited circumstances described within our privacy policy. So that's an example. Now there's no federal law that prevents the sale of most fitness related information to third parties. This information, and it's important to note, is not covered by the HIPAA law, which is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. So that's an important note. As such, Google's $2.1 billion planned acquisition of Fitbit, which was announced back in November of 2019, started to set off some alarm bells among global regulators over antitrust and privacy worries. Now, Google already owns the biggest search engine, already owns the most popular and largest video streaming site, the biggest mobile operating system, Android, and the most dominant email service, Gmail. All of these feed this machine that is a digital advertising business that generated over $135 billion in sales last year. The concern here, of course, is that adding in personal fitness, health, location, because remember these things have GPS in them, adding that data to Google's already massive database of information could pose some challenges. Now, Fitbit generates maybe a billion dollars in sales a year. That's a mere pittance relative to Google's Alphabet's total revenue. The value that Google sees in the acquisition is in the data that Fitbit is accumulating on all of its users. Knowing how far, how often people walk, run, cycle, swim, all the activities they do, climbing stairs, could help advertisers, health insurers, city planners, and a lot of other people. That's the long term vision that Google has. Now, it's unlikely that Google's going to sell that information directly to advertisers. It would help build more complete advertising profiles of its users, though. In that sense, the fitness tracker market isn't necessarily as discreet from Google's dominant ad business. It could feed into it, creating more complete user profiles, further extending Google's dominance in the ad space. Now, what's interesting is, even though Google is dominant, in the digital advertising market, it's not necessarily enough from an antitrust perspective to block a deal in another complete sector. Remember, Google doesn't currently make a health tracker. It doesn't make a smartwatch. It doesn't compete with Fitbit. It isn't trying to consolidate the market. It's not trying to cut out a number of rivals. And in fact, you can make the argument that if Google infuses Fitbit with capital, it might help Fitbit compete more effectively in a smartwatch market that is currently dominated by Apple. So what might regulators do? Well, they could impose restrictions while still approving the deal. And most of these could be around behavioral remedies, which could mean as an example that Google would promise not to merge Fitbit data with any other user information without explicit end user consent. This is an approach that Google had to take with its acquisition of Nest, 
that it acquired back in 2014, where it would not merge the data directly. However, they're not prevented from encouraging users and incentivizing users to merge their Nest data with their Google accounts. All they have to do is build in some interesting features that make it much more convenient. And lo and behold, people will say, hey, maybe I'll merge these two accounts. Another more maybe extreme example could be regulators might prohibit Google from ever extracting fitness information from a user device, particularly in the smartwatch and fitness arena. And that's similar to how Apple actually treats its fitness data from the Apple Watch. And Google has actually indicated that even if that were a restriction, it would still want to acquire Fitbit anyway, even without being able to farm any of its data. The smartwatch market alone is still a very strong and promising market, expected to grow to just under $100 billion by 2027. And remember, Fitbit's products also need to keep working with Apple's iOS operating system as well as Android. Or this could potentially be construed as a tool to force people to buy Android devices. So it's very, very likely that Fitbit will continue to support Android and iOS both. So fairly recently, there has been a group of about 20 non-government organizations that have expressed their concerns to regulators around the world to give this acquisition, this potential acquisition, their utmost attention. European antitrust regulators are expected to decide on the transaction by July 20th. So this is just coming up in about two weeks. They are especially concerned, these EU regulators, with Silicon Valley U.S. companies buying their way into new areas and then potentially stifling competition. One of the theories posited is that wearable devices could someday replace smartphones as the main gateway to the internet, just as smartphones essentially replace personal computers. So if Google expands into this market, edging out other competitors would thus be very significant. However, Google kind of responded to some of these claims and basically just said, look, throughout this process, they've been clear about their commitment not to use Fitbit health and wellness data for Google ads and their responsibility to provide people with choice and control of their own data. And similar to their other products with wearables, Google says they will be transparent about the data they actually collect, why they collect it, and they will never sell personal information to anyone. So this is an interesting test case. It'll be hard for regulators to get this perfectly correct. And the reason the regulators are a little skeptical is because of past behavioral remedies that they have been imposed have not worked. Facebook told Brussels back in 2014 that it wasn't technically possible to merge its data with those of WhatsApp that it acquired. But then they went ahead and did it anyway. And they got a $124 million fine from the European Commission for breaking its agreement. To Facebook, that was nothing. So the regulators are concerned about bad behavior from large tech giants. Google tends to be better behaved than Facebook, but look, it's a huge, huge company and regulators do have some concerns. We'll see how it evolves. I think it's going to go through. I look forward to tighter integration between Google Fit and Fitbit products, as well as the emerging products and explosion of fitness trackers and smartwatches that are coming on in the marketplace. I'm kind of excited about it as a consumer. I geek out about that, but we'll see how it evolves. That's it for this week. We'll see you soon. With that, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to The Fitterist Show. You can follow us on Instagram at Fitterist Mind Body and on Twitter at Fitterist Mind. If you enjoyed this episode, please send it to a friend or subscribe to make sure you don't miss any future episodes of The Fitterist Show. My name is Christopher Allen, and make it a magical day.